Good morning. morning. Welcome to day two. I'm Rich Tarani, and I'm thrilled to have you at the show and uh, be part of the event. How many people went to uh, the sessions yesterday? Oh, that's a great number. So curious, uh, we launched a a whole bunch of new uh, co-located events at this show with a whole bunch of uh, different partners that that have been uh, fantastic to work with. I'm just curious if anybody here went to any of the uh, Smart Grid sessions. Anyone here, anyone here from Smart Grid? Okay. Any comments on the Smart Grid? I'd love to get some some interaction. Any? Uh, did you learn what you wanted to learn there? Any suggestions on improvement? Anyone who went? You guys obviously didn't have enough mojitos. Couple more, mo- we have to uh, infuse some mojito mix in, in the coffee. Okay, so I'll go to the next one, the, the 4G uh, Wireless Evolution Conference. Anyone here go to the 4G? Any comments on the 4G? Things that you wanted to learn that we can improve on? Yes? Okay, the agenda. So thankfully this is being recorded and my marketing team's on it. So that's good. Any other suggestions on 4G WE? Is that something that people, the rest of the people here are interested in? 4G, are you, are you uh, looking at 4G? Is that an area of interest for anyone else here? Yeah, it's a big, big area. Okay. M to M, people familiar with, M, anyone not familiar with M to M? Just a few people, okay. MTM is a pretty interesting uh, technology uh, allowing machine-to-machine communication. Uh, something like an Amazon uh, Kindle would be an example of an M2M communications or sensors in a, in a farm that uh, moderate the amount of water that's being um, sent out to the crops to optimize the output of uh, soil, things like that. Uh, anyone uh, make the M2M sessions here? Interesting. Okay, I wonder if I have a different crowd here because the sessions were pretty packed yesterday. Okay, how about uh, DigiMasters World? How many people are excited about that? Okay, a bunch of people. Any people here uh, use Asterisk, dabble in Asterisk? Wow, it's a good number. We have How many Asterisk ex- experts do we have here? Okay, how many Skype experts do we have here? People that use Skype all the time. A bunch. Wow, you guys are going to like today's keynotes. That's good. All right. All right. Well, with that, I'm going to make some uh, introductory remarks. I want to, of course, thank you all for being here, as well as the partners and sponsor speakers and everyone else who's made this show so good. Also, want to let you know that uh, there's a new session uh, called uh, Megapath University, focusing on MPLS solutions. Uh, quick show of hands. Interest in MPLS? Any anyone interested? Wow, that's a big number. Wow. Okay. So that's that's good news. Uh, Today at 11 o'clock, so room A106 is how you can how you can find that uh, session. And then also today at 12, I'll be moderating a panel on the Avaya Nortel implications. As you may remember or know, uh, today or this week is when Avaya is rolling out their roadmap on the acquisition of the enterprise assets of Nortel. It's a pretty big deal. I mean, Nortel's a 100-year-old company thereabouts, and Avaya and Nortel always were head-to-head competitors, and now they've had the opportunity to merge and try to figure out how to take a diverse suite of products, bring them all together, figure out how to support them, service them, how to deal with the reseller channel, how to deal with customer service. I mean, there's so many different issues that that we'll probably touch on today at 12. So bring your questions, and uh, we'll see you at 12 o'clock in room uh, B214 and B215. Uh, The exhibit hall opens today at 11, and please come to the Delegation of Ontario's Hospitality uh, Party at their networking reception at 5 o'clock. So... uh, did I get that right, marketing team? Did I miss any details on that party? Good, good, good. Okay, also, something really interesting that we're adding to the show for the first time is the Startup Camp Telephony. How many people know that we're doing the Startup Camp Telephony at the show? Okay, wow, that's a, a pretty good number. So it's going to be a venue for people uh, that are starting up as well as the financial community. There will be four startups presenting, never seen before demos, And uh, on top of that, we're going to give away a motorcycle tonight at the reception. uh, And you have to have a card to get the motorcycle. So make sure you get these cards. They're at the front here if you didn't get one. Also at registration if you want to get one later. Get them stamped, and then you could win the motorcycle. Uh, And then tonight, I should also mention that uh, Jamie Siminoff is going to be the 
keynote at the startup camp telephony. Does anyone here know who Jamie is? Does anyone here, okay, a couple hands. Uh, anyone here ever use a service called PhoneTag or Simulscribe? Wow, a couple of you. All right, so Jamie was the founder of the Simulscribe service that became PhoneTag, and it's a very innovative voicemail to text service. Now there's a bunch of other companies that do a similar type thing. How many people here use a, a voicemail to text service? Like a Google Voice or a few people, wow. So, okay, I recommend it highly. It's an unbelievable type. I'm not <clears throat> plugging any particular service, just any of them. They're really interesting because they allow you to get your voicemails sent to you via email. So you're in a meeting, you're at a conference, you're wherever, somebody leaves you an important message, you can actually see what the message says and then you can respond to it, you can forward it, you can email the person back. I mean, it's really an innovative kind of technology that I think especially the the leading edge of telecom, which are the people in this room, should, should at least try out. And I should make one comment. I notice a lot of people are standing in the back. Feel free to have a seat. You can get up later if you like. Uh, you can still have access to the door. So if you want, there are seats available over there. So with that, thank you so much. I'm going to introduce our uh, first keynoter, who's uh, Christopher Dean, who is the Chief Strategy Officer of Skype. You may be interested in knowing what does Christopher do, what, what are his responsibilities at Skype. Obviously, he deals with uh, corporate strategy, but he's also a person who's deeply involved in the M&A activities of the company. And also, he runs an innovation group that he was telling me about a little bit earlier called uh, Skype Works, kind of a play on Skunk Works, so that's kind of cool. And hopefully we'll talk about that a little bit. And I would appreciate if you could join me in welcoming him to the stage. Thank you. Thanks, Rich. Thank you. Appreciate it. Okay. Can you uh, put my slides up, please? Um, so uh, thanks for that kind introduction, and thank you guys for joining me today. Um, in the next half hour, which we'll make happen, I promise, uh, I'm going to try to tie together uh, some of the trends uh, you've heard about and are going to hear about over the next couple of days, um, and hopefully set some context for the future of IP communications and uh, driven by <coughs> 4G in particular. So I'm going to touch on uh, <coughs> the definition of the fourth wave of the Internet, and I'm going to steal uh, Mary Meeker's concept and uh, define it as the mobile consumer. Uh, Looking at, I'm going to look at and give you our vision of uh, communications uh, from Skype's perspective. Um, look at the status of 3G and 4G deployments today and how that uh, can support <coughs> our vision of communications in particular in the mobile space. Uh, um, just briefly touch on uh, some 4G adoption drivers and then give you a case study on what we think a uh, new business model uh, looks like uh, in the 4G world and partnerships and how partnerships need to change. Uh, between third-party application developers, uh, mobile operators, and handset manufacturers. So, so at, <clears throat> at the core, I'd like to try to leave you three messages. So there's an ongoing sea change uh, in the telecommunications market, and we think that's accelerating. Uh, so that's one. Uh, two, I'd like to focus on the importance of mobility from uh, Skype's perspective. And this is just a central strategic element of, uh, of what we uh, uh, are trying to do in the next few years. And three, <clears throat> that these changes that are occurring in the market offer uh, both immense risk for operators that don't actually adapt and change, but also an incredible amount of opportunity for those that do and that develop uh, new, new business models. So, <clears throat> so what's the fourth wave of the Internet? Um, the first wave was access over the mainframe, the mini, the PC computer. <clears throat> the second wave, in our mind, or Mary's mind, was... Uh, web 2.0. The third wave is really the mobile internet driven by 3G. Um, and the fourth wave is really about uh, the era of the mobile consumer. And that mobile consumer is going to connect to the internet uh, over uh, mobile wireless networks with 10 times the number of network connected devices across a, a plethora of, of different devices and applications. Um, so why do we believe this? Um, we think that there's good examples today, iPhone probably being the best one, of uh, uh, incredible pent-up demand that we've seen. Put the right user interface in place, 
put the right device in place, put the right business model with a rich set of third-party applications, and we've just seen an incredible amount of demand. So we actually think that, that this acceleration, uh, we think that the adoption of uh, these solutions is only accelerating. Uh, here's a, another chart from Mary. Um, and comparing uh, the mobile internet and the adoption in the first eight quarters compared to uh, the desktop internet. So, um, but one of the issues that we're facing today is that we're seeing an incredible explosion of data usage. Um, there's been a 5,000% increase in data usage on uh, AT&T's 3G network since the adoption uh, and the launch, or at least in the last six quarters, not specifically tied to the iPhone, but clearly from our perspective. That's what's happening. Um, and certainly Wi-Fi, femto cells, Pico cells may offer some network offload uh, opportunity to get rid of some of the congestion that's happening on the, uh, on the 3G network today. But we actually really believe that it's the uh, advent of 4G that's got the opportunity to uh, uh, truly uh, unclog the network and really deliver uh, the underlying promise for uh, the fourth wave of the mobile consumer. Another interesting thing to point out is that um, mobile is really over, about to overtake <clears throat> the desktop in terms of individuals who are accessing the Internet. Um, so by 2013, uh, more people will access the Internet over a mobile device, or the average user who accesses the Internet for the first time will access that over a mobile device as opposed to a desktop device. So we think that... Uh, Again, the advent of 4G is going to be very important to delivering a very, very good and usable experience uh, to those users. And it, it's really not just, 4G is really not just about uh, unclogging these pipes and delivering uh, broader data. It's also about uh, continuing uh, to unleash the real innovation that has been driven by uh, third-party application developers uh, um, in the Internet world as it moves uh, into the mobile world. So let me talk about uh, vision for our vision for communications for a minute. So um, the rise of the mobile consumer and the importance of third-party applications in the 4G world is, is being driven by, partially being driven by, this ongoing massive transformation that's occurring in communications. So in the past, we had a dedicated appliance called the telephone tied to a specific purpose-built uh, network, the PSTN. Um, we're now moving into a world today where there's a broad range of multipurpose devices that are connecting over a general uh, purpose IP network with uh, a variety of custom applications that you can download and put on those devices. Where we ultimately believe we're going is to a set of cloud-based services accessed by a myriad of network devices um, <clears throat> and uh, offering consumers a great deal of flexibility. So, so in this emerging world, applications and functionality will principally be delivered by the software or the services layer. End users are going to be offered broader and broader, a uh, broader and broader set of choices. And we believe that those end users are actually going to consume them at a greater rate and that they're willing to pay for it. So there's this massive transformation going on, and we actually believe that this offers a large amount of opportunity for. Um, uh, all of the players in the, in the um, communication space in particular. Uh, let's uh, dig into the mobile space a little bit. So <clears throat> this vision, from our perspective, enables Skype and other communication services to be available everywhere, um, accessed over three principal devices. Uh, the desktop computer, which is our core business, and we today have 520 million users globally using it. Um, you may have uh, heard some of our announcements at CES last week, where both Panasonic and LG are, uh, have announced that they're integrating Skype into their flat panel televisions. Um, and we also rolled out uh, some HD video news, uh, where we are continuing to increase the, the quality of our, of our experiences. And then thirdly, the third major screen from our perspective is the mobile device. Um, and that is a core central strategic push. So from our perspective, in order to be relevant uh, in the age of the mobile consumer, we believe that we have to make Skype uh, both available and easy to use on the 3 billion, soon to be 4 billion mobile devices uh, globally. And we intend to do that by enhancing and enriching the traditional Skype desktop experience 
uh, and extending that to all leading smartphone operating systems uh, and feature phones through a range of, uh, of products. And I'll, and I'll talk about that in a little bit. So in this future vision, we also believe that communications can flow like water uh, in a liquid form across multiple devices with call transfers occurring seamlessly. So I can start a call on my desktop computer, and I can uh, get up and transfer that call to my mobile device, <coughs> get in my car, transfer it into, my, uh, into the onboard network, into the telematic system, uh, uh, drive home, transfer that call onto my flat panel TV, and then walk into the kitchen and continue the conversation with my mother and have her help me uh, with my risotto recipe. So <laughs> um, that one's a little silly, but uh, from a network-connected device perspective, we think that that is absolutely uh, an opportunity. So, but this vision requires tight integration between the 3G, the 4G network, Wi-Fi, and the broadband networks with good throughput. And we view the deployment of the 4G network as a pivotal moment for the realization of that, of that uh, vision. So today, we're continuing to add growing richness uh, to a variety of our device types. For example, we're approaching excellent HD video quality and super wideband audio quality in a wireline broadband environment. Uh, but in a mobile environment, our ability to deliver these experiences is limited due to the data congestion on 3G networks. 4G offers the chance for us to relieve that congestion. But 4G in the era of the mobile consumer will bring more than just fat or data pipes. Um, it'll bring the full creative power of the internet and internet developers uh, to a plethora of devices in the mobile world. PCs, laptops, e phones, e-readers, TVs, cars, water, your water meter aren't simply just going to be connected <clears throat> to the 4G network. Uh, they're going to be benefiting from and running smarter and more clever applications that should improve almost every aspect of your life. So if that's the vision, how far are we down the road towards the fourth wave of the, uh, of the internet, the mobile consumer? <clears throat> um, how mobile is the internet now? So analysts estimate that there'll be 4 billion mobile subscribers by 2013. And we're seeing more, uh, a greater and greater penetration of smartphones. Today, about 15% of the market is smartphones. We've seen multiple analyst estimates uh, claiming that they're growing to about 38% by 2013. And of those smartphones, today, 45% of them have a Wi-Fi radio in them. We see that attach rate growing up to uh, 90% by 2014. But really, 3G today isn't that broadly penetrated, about 21% of uh, mobile subscribers have access to 3G networks. We think that's getting to the point where we're reaching an inflection point, but it's really very early in the adoption cycle. So early in the deployment cycle from a 3G perspective, but we are reaching an inflection point. Um, 3G data networks in certain cities, I live in San Francisco, uh, and it's just it's a, it is a very congested data network right now, uh, overwhelmed by iPhone usage. AT&T has seen a 5,000% increase in its data usage on its network in the last six quarters. We actually feel that congestion is limiting rich new communication applications like Skype. We see some opportunities to offload some of that from the data network, Wi-Fi, Pico, Femto. But 4G, we think, is really offering some of the potential to unclog that network. So where's 4G? Skype's a software manufacturer, so really from our perspective, we're indifferent on whether it's LTE or whether it's WiMAX. Um, there are about 460 WiMAX networks that are deployed in 135 countries today. Uh, today, 430 million, uh, in 2009, 430 million people currently had access, growing to about 800 million in 2010. And over 30 network operators have committed to deploy LTE on a worldwide basis, which should represent about 100 million LTE subscribers by 2014. Um, there's a massive and ongoing CapEx infrastructure build-out and investment in the radio network infrastructure. About $49 billion were spent in 2009, even in the face of uh, the economic recession. And that's beginning to address a set what, what analysts are estimating to be about a $70 billion 
market opportunity in service revenue by 2014. And we actually think that the, the market uh, adoption drivers for 4G versus 3G are going to be a little bit different. Uh, um, 3G was initially principally driven by data dongles and uh, um, <clears throat> business usage. We actually think that 4G is going to be driven by these integrated, seamlessly connected consumer devices uh, uh, across a range of uh, a range of different use cases. So we actually think that it's going to it's going to present itself in a different way, and it can be adopted a little more quickly. So to summarize, it's very early in the deployment cycle. There's massive cap access required for, from an infrastructure build out. Uh, but there is a very large market opportunity with pent up demand. And, and from our perspective today, we actually believe there's a large opportunity for carriers to accelerate their deployment. If a carrier accelerates its deployment today, it can deliver fatter pipes and it can begin to look towards partnering with application developers to offer differentiated services that can drive new revenue streams. And let me try to dive into that a little bit and give you, give you an example of that. So um, I'll give you a little background on Skype. You may know some of this, so uh, uh, excuse me if I bore you. So Skype is focused on enabling the world's conversations. That's our mission. Um, we let you talk, chat, or do video calls for free. And you can call out to landlines or mobiles anywhere in the world on average for about two cents a minute. So we make software only software, but it's software that does amazing things. It turns your PC or your TV into a communication device. Uh, it offers low cost, lower cost calling options on your mobile device. It allows you to communicate richly uh, for free uh, with any other Skype user. So we've historically been thought of as a disruptive influence in the telecommunications market. But let me try to dissuade you of some of that perspective and provide you with proof points uh, that actually we think prove that we're a very good or even a great partner for a mobile operator uh, and a device manufacturer, um, <clears throat> and we can help lead the adoption of both 3G and 4G services. So Skype today has massive and accelerating usage. Uh, you might have seen Telegeography, which is one of the key uh, market analysts that estimates uh, uh, long distance minutes globally. They came out with their new report last week, and they said that we now represent about 12% uh, of all of the long distance minutes globally. And this is a combination of both Skype to Skype and Skype out calling. So that's massive use. The, the study last year said that we represented about 8%, so growing pretty quickly. Um, and it's, we've got a pretty powerful business model behind that too. Uh, we're in our 11th quarter of profitability. Uh, our 03, uh, Q3 uh, 2009 revenue was $185 million. Uh, that represents uh, about a 36% year-to-year uh, -year growth from a revenue perspective. On any given day, you can find about 22 million users connected simultaneously. Uh, we have delivered about 27 billion minutes of Skype to Skype calling and about 5 billion minutes of video calling. Um, and, and the part that's really exciting from our perspective is video is, is, is really taking off and really growing. So uh, our video usage is up about five times uh, it, within, between 07 and 08. This is even accelerated in 09. In 08, about 34% of all of our calls had video in them. Uh, and on holidays like Christmas and New Year's, it's peaking well over 50%. So, so video is rich. It's a catalyst for adoption. And we think it's extremely exciting. And we, and we also feel that way with regards to the mobile space. So let me shift into mobile for a second. So Skype has a three-part mobile strategy. One, we've got a direct-to-consumer download strategy. Uh, we've got applications on leading uh, uh, smartphone operating systems. <clears throat> We're also working with various OEMs to deeply integrate and preload uh, Skype into their uh, operating systems and uh, into the address book. Uh, probably the best example of that is the Nokia N900. And we are integrated uh, with uh, some carriers, uh, three being uh, the principal example. <clears throat> so from a, from a success perspective, uh, we've had about 10 million downloads of the iPhone and the iPod Touch at this stage. Uh, if, you, if you get a chance to look at the uh, Nokia N900 integration, it's really exciting. Um, and then with three, we're pushing about 100 million Skype to Skype minutes each month. Uh, so uh, we're seeing some decent, decent success there. Um, and, our, and our, our mobile value proposition is, is evolving a little bit. So it's really about free Skype to Skype calls to your Skype contacts, always on, always connected. Uh, cheap calls uh, from your mobile phone uh, to uh, landlines and mobiles. Instant messaging anywhere you go. 
And then in the near future, it's going to be about video, video on mobile uh, from anywhere for free. So the three uh, partnership from a case study perspective, established in 07, uh, available on all their price plans, uh, available on nearly all their handsets, supports the basic Skype functionality, <coughs> which is getting more and more integrated. About 10% of all their UK handsets have Skype on it at this stage. The growth is continuing. A lot of it is principally led by a Skype phone uh, that is available, a dedicated hero Skype phone. Um, <coughs> and really, th this is the crux of it. So um, to summarize the experience that Three's had so far, Skype users, as compared to non-Skype users on the Three network, generate 20% higher margins for Three versus non-Skype users. They drive 45% higher domestic voice revenues. They drive 17% uh, percent more non-Skype minutes than non-Skype users. And about 79% of the users who purchase the Skype phone are entirely new to the Three network. So it turns out that, that Skype users actually are sophisticated, big communicators. Uh, and the experience at Three is it actually core, drives the operator's core business model, um, which I think is actually interesting news and, uh, and, and, it, and is, uh, is probably different than what a lot of people think. So, so what's going on? So what's going to happen when the internet and the mobile world collide? Um, from an industry perspective, 4G is a technology that's going to lead to the convergence or the colliding of these two most powerful, very dynamic industries, the internet industry and the wireless market. So whether this is going to be a collision or a convergence is really in our hands. Um, so as you know, we've got this reputation for being disruptive, uh, in a disruptive influence in the communications market. We've got no apologies for doing that, but, but, but as I think I just pointed out, you might be surprised that we are at the forefront of helping these two industries come together with good new partnership models. Uh, and we think the three case study is a very, very good example of that. So we also believe that this, this, this collision, this, this uh, convergence is gonna really benefit the end user. Uh, and ultimately, Billions of new consumers are going to consume and adopt interesting new experiences running over 4G networks. And that, in my, our minds, ultimately means that uh, it's going to benefit the operators and the handset manufacturers and the application developers who are delivering uh, those solutions. So in this world, software is going to be a driver of innovation for 4G. Um, it's going to be led by third-party application developers with a strong emphasis on consumer applications from our perspective. And that there, and there are new opportunities for partnerships between operators, application developers, and device manufacturers, and those partnerships are in fact necessary to capture the market opportunity at hand. So three questions. So in the era of the mobile consumer running over a 4G network, uh, who owns the customer? Um, from our perspective, it really has to be uh, different. It's got to be multiple parties end up owning the customer. It's not a single party. So. And the question is, how open is the infrastructure in that world? And from our perspective, there needs to be a little bit of a shift in carrier thinking to adopt more innovative and more open approach to be more willing to let applications run on devices on the network uh, in less of a controlled manner. Um, and then who ultimately controls what the users do? And from our perspective, it's actually they do. <laughs> so, um, and the, the tide of history is giving more and more choice to consumers uh, through uh, the adoption of internet technologies, and the adoption of mobile technologies. And from our perspective, rather than trying to stem that and control them, let's let it free. Let's, uh, let's, let's, let's tie our business models to letting users do what they want to do with a plethora of third-party applications on, uh, uh, on these networks. And who ultimately, how, do, how does the partnership model work? Are, are, people, are they equal partners? How, uh, we actually think that there needs to be a fair bit of innovative thinking and flexibility um, around this. So, and ultimately, what does this mean? It, it really, we think, means that the consumer is almost always going to win. Um, and be careful if you don't believe that. This is an interesting statistic. Uh, which says that 80% of executives believe their companies deliver outstanding and superior, superior value uh, and a customer experience, and only 8% of the customer, consumers agree. So, so let's deliver the consumers, the customers, what they want. So, so let me conclude uh, and say that we've looked at some of the trends uh, that are going on in the, in the communications market. There's dramatic change that's going on. Customers are demanding and using 
new technologies and devices. It's making their communications easier, more efficient, less expensive. And from our perspective, that's, of course, what Skype's all about. Um, so, so we feel that there's actually a huge opportunity and growing demand for applications like ours and others in the mobile consumer space. Um, we think that uh, the Internet world application developers and mobile operators are going to need to form new partnerships and adapt their business models to drive innovation rapidly. And we think that the winners in that market are going to be uh, those that combine and focus on providing rich user experiences with flexible monetization models. So that's it. Thanks. Thanks, Rich. Thank you. So quick question. I mentioned yesterday how there's this massive convergence of convergence and industries overlapping. Uh, how many people here have uh, Skype integrated to their TV? Or have, I guess it's only been a couple weeks since the announcement came out. I'm not even sure if, if it's possible to buy the products. But how many people here would be interested in trying that out, Skype on the TVs? Wow. That's like about 20, 25% of the audience. So uh, paying maybe – so I, I have a question actually from Chris. I don't know if Chris left or he's still mic'd up. Chris, is there an additional cost to a consumer to add Skype to a traditional TV? Uh, right now, you have to buy a camera plug-in for generation of TVs. So USB camera for the first gen. That's awesome. So eventually it'll just be an add-on to your TV. That's really amazing. So again, the convergence and the changing of industries, it's, it's truly incredible what's happening. Right now there's no cost. Well, right now you have to put the USB camera in. But well, Skype, will probably, Skype to Skype is free, right? So you'll, you'll, the Skype out will still, that's how they've been making their money. So it's an interesting model. Very interesting. So what's that? Yeah, you said, well, you know, we're all buying new TVs all the time, it seems, right? Uh, so with that, um, from Skype, we're going to make a transition to uh, open source. And we're going to uh, have with us uh, someone who's been on the stage here before and has done a great job representing the open source communications industry. Uh, it is uh, someone who I've known for a number of years, and I visited down in Huntsville, Alabama, on numerous occasions. Uh, it's Danny Windham, who is uh, with uh, Digium, and uh, the CEO, and um, let me just double check here. I'm sorry, President and COO of the company. So please join me in welcoming him to the stage. Thanks, Rick. Yeah, but that's okay. <laughs> Good morning. My name is Danny Windham. I am with Digium. On behalf of IT Expo and the TMC team and Digium Asterisk World and the team from Digium, I'd like to welcome you here. I'd also like to thank you for being here. And I'm interested in knowing how many of you were here last year? All right, pretty good number. So I'm going to assume that all the rest of you are here for the first time, or, or maybe you've got rotator cuff damage from as answering all of Rich's questions. And in the in the year that we've had since we were here last year, uh, a lot of things have changed. One of the things that was interesting to me is when we were here last year, uh, and I gave a keynote presentation, I would say that we were at the peak of panic associated with what was going on in the world's economy. We were worried about world bank failures. The economy was in meltdown. Our U.S. economy was shedding jobs at six or 700,000 jobs a month. It was a pretty scary time. And, that, and I stood here and predicted 2009 would be a very challenging year. Now, given that backdrop, that might have not have been a very insightful prediction. But I think for many companies, that came true. And that got me to thinking about just how different things were at the end of this decade, that decade, than they were at the beginning of that decade. And, and just speaking of that decade, I don't really know what to call it. You know, the, the 2000s, that's kind of hard to say. The zeros or the nils or the nadas, none of that makes sense. So I just remember 
term my grandfather had for zero, it was not. So I'm going to call this the not decade. And my first impression was that the not decade for the telephony industry was the decade from hell. And then I started looking at the things that happened in that decade and trying to answer the question, was it the decade from hell or not? So I'd like to spend a little time today trying to answer that question. I think we could all agree that the telephony industry that existed at the beginning of the not decade has little resemblance to that that existed at the end of the decade. So at the beginning of the decade, things were really good. It was a very happy time in, on Wall Street. The economy was strong. This industry was healthy and wealthy. Y2K had driven infrastructure upgrades and driven a lot of revenue for the suppliers in this industry. We all survived the clock striking 12 at midnight on Y2K, and the world didn't come to an end, and we were happy about that. Nortel's market cap in 2000 was in excess of $300 billion. Lucent's market cap in the year 2000 was in excess of $250 billion. And it was 2000 that Avaya spun out and created its own separate company. And there were a couple of events that at that time might not have seemed significant to the communications industry, but ultimately turned out to be very significant. The very first version of Cisco Call Manager was introduced. Now, Cisco had acquired Celsius in 1998, and they had marketed a product under the Celsius brand for a year and a half or so, but 2000, the very first introduction of a Cisco-branded call manager. And in Alabama, a little project had been started that at this point was really just an infant because it was less than a year old, but it was the Asterisk Open Source Telephony Project. If I compare that to the end of the decade, however, in 2009, it was a pretty scary time. Industry was in turmoil. Our economy was in turmoil. The world economy had essentially melted down. And if you compare what the vendor landscape looked like at the end of the decade versus the beginning of the decade, what you would find is that market caps had plummeted for one, but all these companies that were public at one point, including Avaya and Siemens Enterprise and, and Mitel, had all become private companies. And now Nortel, at least the enterprise division of Nortel, has become a private company through the acquisition by Avaya, who later today, I suppose, is explaining how they're going to bring those two products to market as a single brand. Now, admittedly, Avaya didn't buy all of Nortel, but just pretend that the enterprise assets were worth a third of Nortel at the beginning of the decade or so. That means what was worth $100 billion at the beginning of the decade was worth less than a billion dollars at the end of the decade. And so if you were a stockholder there, you saw you know, less than 1% of your value across a relatively short 10-year period. And meanwhile, back in the open source world, asterisk turned 10 years old. So if, if we look at what happened during the decade from a user's perspective, I think things are very different today than they were at the beginning of the decade. If you were accustomed to running voice services inside of a, an enterprise particularly, then what I think you would say at the end of the decade is that the big iron PBX market is a dying market because voice has become an application that runs across a data network running on standardized hardware. Separate telephony departments are headed toward extinction. So if you're in a company that has a voice and a data department today, I think you're very much in the minority. Those have been combined. Long distance charges are no longer the single biggest line item on an IT budget. So at the beginning of the decade, I think it was very common for companies, particularly for the recurring portion of their IT budget, that long distance charges were the single largest line item driving it. And you spent a lot of energy trying to figure out how to minimize that. If you look at what happened from a market share perspective, let's look from the voice market, the single largest um, market opportunity is for PBXs. So let's look at what the market share was in the year 2000 for PBXs. This data, by the way, is complements of Eastern Management Group who has tracked the PBX market for the past 25 years. And they suggest that at the beginning of the decade, Avaya and Nortel combined had more than 50% market share. And there are names on this list of companies that have merged together, Intertel and Mitel as an example, and names of companies that no longer exist. 
And if you compare what the market share looked like at the end of the decade, Avaya and Nortel together still have a sizable market share, but it's significantly less than half. Oh, sorry. And there are new entrants on this slide that didn't even show up in the year 2000, Cisco and Shortel, as an example. But possibly the most surprising fact on this slide is that the leading market shareholder today in one decade is really not even a company. It's open source telephony, which has created an entire industry around open source telephony. Eastern Management also tracks what has happened to pricing in this marketplace. So I believe this is manufacturer suggested list pricing, and it's the average selling price of what PBX's cost at the beginning of the decade versus the end of the decade. And there's more than a 33% drop in just the equipment cost, not to mention the cost of managing it and all the other costs associated with it have been reduced as well. So what happened? What drove all of this change? And I think you can look back and identify a number of very high-level industry trends that we can say were responsible for driving these changes in the marketplace. And if we sort of start maybe at the beginning of the decade and work our way through the decade, the very first one is that data networks became reliable enough to support voice. I believe at the beginning of the decade, many companies thought, you know, I really hate for my data network to go down, but business transactions in my company are conducted by people talking to people, and I can't afford for the voice network to go down. And so we had this gold-plated, highly reliable, highly available voice network, and we were reluctant to put voice onto our data network because it didn't have the same level of reliability. But if you look at how business is transacted today, I believe the majority of business is transacted with computers talking to computers. Electronic data interchange, web-based credit card orders, none of those require voice-to-voice -voice communication. So we evolved into a position where it became imperative that the data network be as reliable as the voice network had traditionally been. And as that happened, it became okay to move voice onto that network. IP became the preferred transport layer for all data types. Now, if we were debating this at the beginning of the decade, I'm not sure that we would have all predicted that IP would win. There were transport protocols that were engineered specifically with the goal of addressing data types other than data, voice and video, minimizing latency and making that work really well in the presence of bandwidth being very expensive. However, that premise didn't hold true, and IP won that war. And as IP won that war, then voice over IP began displacing the traditional TDM telephony model that was in existence at the beginning of the decade. Bandwidth costs plummeted. This trend contributed to IP winning the war. IP maybe was never the most um, latency, bandwidth efficient protocol we could have chosen, but because so many organizations were deploying IP in the enterprise for local area networks, it drove economies of scale the pricing of the technology associated with IP allowed it to, to win that war. And it was primarily because we over-engineered the bandwidth to the spot where it really didn't matter. Bandwidth suffered from a couple of things that happened. If you think being a big iron PBX manufacturer in the knots decade was a difficult spot to be, if you had been someone who was trying to skim margin off of bandwidth in the knots decade, I suspect you were completely out of business at this point. But we suffered from two problems. One, the dot-com gold rush of the late 90s drove so much investment in the infrastructure that there was an oversupply of bandwidth. That happened primarily in the early, early part of the decade. In the later part of the decade, what you saw was disruptive business models, Skype as an example. Free economics, not freak economics, but free economics, the business model drove 12% of the world's long-distance business onto a network that's providing connectivity primarily for free. Communication systems became software products. As voice became an application running on a data network, it enabled voice applications to become software and to adopt more traditional software business models in, in lieu of the traditional hardware models that had been existing at the beginning of the decade. And open source software. The development methodology associated with building an open source project has disrupted the proprietary alternative. 
So it's always interesting to go back and look at what happened. It's maybe more valuable to go back and try to understand why things happened. And in my contention, the reason all of these things happened, the one underlying trend that's common to every one of these is it's all about the money. So running a single department costs less than running two departments which drove the consolidation of voice and data within an enterprise. Installing a single infrastructure costs less than installing two. If you've got a voice network and a data network, that's twice the cost. Bandwidth fell victim to a number of problems, but the fact that the bandwidth is a lot cheaper today has allowed us to implement alternatives that weren't possible really at the beginning of the decade. Wired Magazine published something very interesting this month. They went back and looked at the cost of bandwidth and they looked at it with regard to Netflix. So Netflix has a relatively new service where you can stream movies to your, to your television. And they stream movies today, I presume, in an MPEG-4 format. That's about 3 megabits per second or so. And a movie lasts two hours. So you can compute how much bandwidth it takes to get two hours worth of movie at 3 megabits a second. Now, they uh, concluded that Netflix pays about 5 cents to be able to stream that. And if you did that at the beginning of the decade, it would have cost something in excess of $250. So more than a three order of magnitude reduction in bandwidth cost in less than 10 years. Standards-based, high, uh, high volume computers cost less than custom big iron PBX hardware. That has enabled the trend of software running on standardized equipment to displace traditional big iron PBXs. And open source costs less than proprietary alternatives. Now, is open source free? Not really, if you're going to use it and make it reliable. But open source shifts the power from traditional proprietary vendors into the hands of the end users or the systems integrators creating those solutions. So what really happened? Users seeking to lower their cost drove all of these trends. And if part of the value of looking back in time and trying to understand what happened is being able to apply that to the future, can we learn anything from the past decade that we can apply to this decade? I think the answer to that is yes. Users seeking to lower their cost will drive a number of new industry trends. So why don't we take a few minutes and speculate on what those trends might be? Well, the first one I hope is really not a trend. In fact, I hope it terminates pretty early in the decade. But the economic pressures and the economic weakness that exists in our market today is driving cost pressure within organizations to figure out how to do more with less. In fact, the downturn in the economy has taught companies how to do more with less. We've looked at the concept of job recovery in the United States and predicted that jobs are going to improve. My contention is companies have learned how to do the job with their existing workforce. And until company revenues begin to expand, you're not going to see jobs replaced just for the fact of replacing those jobs, even because profits are up. Discretionary spending has been reduced. And these market conditions now favor lower cost alternatives um, over their premium branded alternatives. You know, the day of you never get fired for buying X, I think maybe are over. Because you might get fired if you spent way too much money to solve a problem you could have solved for a lot. And the economic pressures are raising interest in low-cost alternatives like open source. Gartner says that we had about a 4% decline in IT spending 2008 versus 2009. Now, IT is a broad topic. What impact might that have had to VoIP? Because VoIP as a category seems to be one of the brighter spots on the horizon of the overall IT spending market. So Channel Web did a survey late in 2009 that suggested that 26% 20, of CIOs see VoIP as a way to save money. So under the theme of saving money drives behavior, um, VoIP maybe has a future there. 70% of CIOs expect to make near-term investments in VoIP and According to the survey, VoIP was the fourth highest area of expected investment in the near term. And 21% of VARs named VoIP as the technology that would generate them the most near term growth. 
Next trend, speculative trend, is that unified communications adoption will rise. Unified communications is a term that has very broad definition. And just for the purposes of talking about it here, let's just say that it is a whole bunch of communications applications bundled into one complete solution. Things like voice facts, presence, conferencing, chat, video. The market for UC products was estimated to be about $3 billion in 2009 by Forster, but it's predicted to be $18 billion in 2012. Now, I wouldn't suggest that we're going to see a six-fold increase in the UC market in that time period. What I think is underneath that is that products that have been categorized as IPPBXs or small business phone systems in the past will morph into unified communications products. Digim, as an example, will build a, a product that is a small business IPPBX called SwitchFox. A prior release supported voice, presence, and conferencing. And then we added fax, chat, and video. And when we did, we started referring to it as a unified communications product. And we report those revenues that way. Mobility becomes a bigger player in corporate communications. Now, it appears that Christopher and I actually coordinated these presentations because we're even citing some of the same market research. Wasn't the case, but maybe that means that we fundamentally agree on where the market is headed. And in fact, I don't really disagree with anything that Christopher said. Um, I think Christopher's view is maybe a longer-term view, and I see some steps along the way that allow us to get to that long-term view. One of those steps is that networks, mobile networks, have to be sufficiently evolved to provide a happy user experience when you're using mobile VoIP. And 3G can do that today. Certainly 4G does that in the future. And whether the evolution is Wi-Fi, WiMAX, or LTE, or whatever, the prediction is that by the end of this decade, 50% of mobile traffic will be VoIP. Christopher mentioned that today, 15% of all mobile phones are smartphones, going to almost 40% by 2013, which says there will be 1.5 billion smartphones and in our view, those are all things that are looking for ways to be connected to your traditional corporate connectivity. So today, most of you probably have a phone on your desktop, and most of you probably have a phone in your pocket. But the things that make this desirable for me are very different than the things that make a desktop device desirable for me. This needs to have good battery life. It needs to fit in my pocket. It needs to have a good user interface. But in terms of Skype, going on to a television, Skype's going on to the television because we like looking at really big screens. And so the attributes of what make a good desktop experience include great audio quality, good conferencing capabilities, bigger screens. And so I see that living into the future. And what that means is you need a way to connect these devices. So fixed mobile convergence grows in its adoption with an estimated six-fold increase in the amount of fixed mobile convergent connections that occur in the next five years. Voice services join the cloud computing party, maybe as a late entrant. IDC has predicted, because cloud computing is all the rage at this moment, that cloud computing will capture 25% of the IT spend in the next five years, and we'll see a threefold increase in what's spent there. Now, when I think of cloud computing um, over tra traditional hosted services, it makes me think of a couple of things. One, virtualization, and two, elasticity. Now, a PBX as an application really does not benefit from the elasticity portion of cloud computing. I want our company's PBX to be on 24 hours a day, 365 days a year, and I want our customers to be able to interact with that. If you have an application that needs to spin up for a while and then you want to turn it off, the elasticity element of cloud computing is very desirable. However, PBX as an application can benefit from virtualization why? Because it lowers the cost of the hardware. And under the theme that cost drives all trends, we'll see the adoption of cloud computing or moreover, traditional hosted voice services grow. But early on, that adoption comes primarily from smaller businesses who are better served by the underlying business model of hosted services. I'm with Digium, I would be remiss if I didn't forecast that open source continues to disrupt proprietary alternatives. Forrester recently did a study to understand the attitudes toward open source adoption across lots of companies in North America and in Europe. And what they learned was, on average, maybe 30% of companies have adopted open source today. 
And on average, <clears throat> about 40% of companies are either piloting or considering open source. And so the opportunity for the adoption of open source to double in the near term is there. There may be some of you in the audience who are of that 30% of the remaining portion that has not been exposed to open source, maybe doesn't understand what open source is. Um, Eastern Management Group has forecasted that today, Asterisk holds about 88% of the open source telephony market. And so I predict that Asterisk will continue to be the de facto choice for open source telephony. And I'll give you some insight into why I believe that. Asterisk itself is an open source project. It's software. And it's, most, it's best thought of as an engine from which you can build almost any sort of communications applications. PBX, soft switch, conferencing server, whatever. And the amount of momentum that is behind the project is the reason that I predict that one will win the open source telephony war because it's been 10 years in the making. Today, there are more than 65,000 community members. It's deployed in more than 170 countries. There are over 2 million downloads of Asterisk just last year. There are over 800 active and current contributors. There's an extensive hardware interoperability matrix, and really it's all about the applications. There are over 150 applications available in Asterisk, either as part of the open source software or through commercial add-ons to the Asterisk project. Another reason is that Asterisk will win is the ecosystem. The ecosystem is huge. There are hundreds of participants in the ecosystem. And today, with Digital Masters World, which is a mini trade show, a mini event inside of the IT Expo event, there are over 20 members of that ecosystem represented today. So I would encourage you to go by and visit them. And Digium is a sponsor and an active proponent of that ecosystem. And we are making, uh, for us, what is a significant announcement at this show, we are announcing the Asterisk Exchange. Asterisk Exchange is a marketplace, which is a one-stop shop for all products that are Asterisk-based. So I'd encourage you to visit uh, AsteriskExchange.com. So we still haven't answered the question of, were the noughts really the te technology decade from hell? Well, I can see where if you were a traditional big iron PBX supplier or one of their employees, you, you might be tempted to answer that question with a resounding yes. But if you were an end user of communication services and products, then during that decade, you saw your equipment costs fall by more than 50%, 33%. You saw your infrastructure management cost fall by more than 50%. You saw your bandwidth cost fall by three orders of magnitude. And you saw the power shift from the traditional proprietary suppliers into the hands of the end users. And so with that as the backdrop for the end users of the communications products and services, I say, no, that wasn't the telephony decade from hell. It was actually one hell of a decade. Rich, do we have for questions? All right, one question. Yes. The question is, where do we go from 88%? Well, I try not to think about it from that perspective. I see open source telephony as a market that is growing at a great rate in itself. And so the opportunity for us to grow in that overall market is great. And there are other projects out there that I suspect will gather some momentum, particularly around specific targeted um, problems that are trying to be solved. But as a generic application trying to solve a very broad open source telephony problem, I see asterisks is continuing to maintain a very high percentage of that share. One more. Well, by the way, there's been a lot of work done in Asterisk in the past year to enable Asterisk to run in a virtualized environment. And I still, if you'll just go back to my basic premise that things that save money drive industry trends. I see virtualization as a way to save money. Um, particularly for those who are hosted service providers, it gives you a very easy mechanism to spin up a service for a customer and put it in place until that customer either doesn't need it or, or moves to a different type of service and then take it away. Um, in general, I see it as a way to lower cost and I think that it has a, a strong future in telephony. All right, Rich, back to you. Thank you, Danny. That was great. Thanks. 
So a uh, question, how many people here use uh, any sort of application store on their mobile phone, downloading apps? Wow, big number. It's like 40, 50%. How many people here wish that they had uh, faster broadband wireless connectivity? Even more people. Okay, good news. The next keynote that we have will be uh, touching on both of those areas, and uh, we're very excited to have him. It's his first time uh, keynoting the show. It's Brian Higgins, who's the Executive Director for Ecosystem Development within Verizon Wireless. His responsibilities touch on LTE, or long-term evolution, as well as the developer support uh, in the uh, Verizon developer community. So please join me in welcoming him to the stage. Thanks. Okay, good morning. All right, that was good over there. I like that. All right. <clears throat> okay. So, you know, I really enjoyed the talk on the Skype side just because a lot of the trends that they were talking about are exactly the kinds of things that we're taking a look at in Verizon Wireless, which is what I want to spend some time on here today. So what I want to try and give you an idea on is, you know, where we think the marketplace is going to be going relative to apps and connectivity and broadband and data and you know, how we're trying to drive that in the marketplace. So I think if you start that off, you know, if you're a carrier, one thing you spend a lot of time thinking about is going to be market penetration, it's meaning that of all the people that are in your domain, with it's the US for Verizon Wireless, how many of those folks are actually carrying a handset today, and how much growth is possible? So if you take a look at what I have on the screen here right now, you'll see that you know, we're at roughly about 90% penetration in the U.S. marketplace. And if you assume that 100% is going to be the ceiling, you recognize that there's a problem relative to long-term growth for someone like a Verizon Wireless or an ATT or a Sprint or a T-Mobile. So the thing you have to do about that is rethink what connectivity means. And if you've heard or read any of the statements by Ivan Seidenberg, CEO for Verizon, Lo McAdam, CEO for Verizon Wireless, what you've probably heard is that the right number isn't 100%, but it's something closer to 500%. So if you're looking at that, you know, what you're recognizing is that it's probably not people running around with five iPhones on their belt, right? five Blackberries. That's not what the future is going to be. It has to be different devices. And you're also probably wondering, you know, if you've got a problem with market penetration, and all of a sudden they say 500%, you know, that's easy, either going to be some, you know, fancy slideware or it's something that's meaningful where a company's driving towards changing the marketplace. Okay, so what I'm hoping I, I can do here today is explain to you what it is that Verizon's doing, and I would probably also argue other carriers are doing, to try and expand in the marketplace relative to WAN connectivity dramatically. So how do you get there? So if you take a look at the devices that are on the screen right now, you probably recognize that those devices are intimately linked to people, right? Someone has to interface with that device. If I'm awake, I'm using it, it's putting data on the network. If I'm asleep, the device is off, it's not putting data on the network. And that's pretty much the way things have been going for a couple of decades for all the carriers. So getting away from people and getting to Internet of Things, these probably shouldn't be new terms for the folks that are in the room here, but this is really the future when we take a look at what's going to be happening with broadband connectivity, and also the application space, meaning that it's not just about your smartphone. It's really going to be about putting intelligence and connectivity into anything and everything that could take advantage of that in the future. Okay, so that, and that's where Verizon is focused. And what I want to try and do is just give you a little perspective on, you know, how do you get there? Because I think that even though we've made statements about 500% penetration is probably the right target for the carriers to look at, I would argue that that's conservative. And part of the reason is some of the new technologies that are coming down the road. So LTE, long-term evolution, you know, most likely the dominant standard for 4G, and I'll talk about why I think that's the case in a couple slides. That started for Verizon many years ago. Okay, so back in 2006, we ran technology trials over in Europe and in the U.S., trying to decide what it was we thought we wanted to do with next generation technologies. End of 2007, spent a little over $9 billion for a good chunk of spectrum, 700 megahertz, arguably the best spectrum that's ever been purchased in the US. 
for the distinct purpose of launching next generation technologies. 2008 launched a program that I'll touch on briefly called Open Development. Okay, so that's a new program we put in place, new business philosophy around getting to the Internet of Things. You know, so that's about not necessarily requiring people to come into a Verizon Wireless store or a Best Buy to talk to a sales rep and bring a device online. It's really about how do you actually get away from the constraints that any corporation like Verizon Wireless has and enable many other things. So it's a brand new business model. 2009, Verizon Developer Community. Okay, that is a new program that we started up to try and partner up with our developers in the application ecosystem. Okay, and the view there is that you know, there are plenty of app stores that are out there. I think everybody knows that. Um, and Verizon doesn't build handsets. We don't build OSs. And for the most part, we don't build a lot of applications. But the view is that there's still tremendous opportunity to work with developers by enabling different things on the network and allowing them to vend or market on the Verizon wireless market. So applications was critical for us for the future. Then towards the end of 2009, 4G Venture Forum was announced, for those that haven't uh, heard about it. Basically what that is is a recognition that like every other company that's out there, you're going to be constrained relative to what you can do for resources, funding, anything else that's required to try and enable a new product or service. So the thinking was if you want to try and do more things on the network, and you recognize you don't have enough people and enough dollars to do all those things, then perhaps the right thing to do is to partner up with the venture community and see how they can collaborate with us to try and enable new ideas. And really kind of with a big focus on smaller parties with the next great idea. So again, another program that we brought together to try and pump up the marketplace to get to that 500% penetration. The last item you know, on this three-year chain here that's uh, probably near and dear to my heart because that sits in my domain is going to be the LTE Innovation Center, and I'll talk about that in a little more detail. But the concept there is that building a facility that allows people to come in, tap into engineering resources from the carrier, and build next-generation devices that we think can take advantage of the kind of capabilities that LTE is going to enable. And then I think the last part, probably the most important part, is that when you do all these things, you pick a technology, you buy some spectrum, you build a new program for the business side, application side, funding, products with the LTE Innovation Center, somebody has to build the network. Okay, and I think we have pretty decent confidence at Verizon that we know how to do it. So we did it going from analog to digital, digital to 2G, 2G to 3G, and we're certainly very deep into making it happen from 3G to 4G. And I'll talk about what the timelines are for that in a little bit. So open development. <clears throat> the reason why this is a big deal and why it was a big change for us is that if you were someone that was building a product and you were coming to Verizon Wireless to try and get that product into our stores, you recognize that it wasn't a trivial process. There were plenty of people you had to talk to. There were lots of forms to fill out. There were tons of tests and trials you had to go through in order to get that product on the network because it was our belief that the network isn't just cell sites and switches, but it's also the end device. And if they're all, not all partnered together perfectly, you're going to have a compromise in the overall quality and reliability of the network, which we still believe is the case. But we also recognize that if you want to try and grow the way we want to grow, you've got to loosen up a little bit. And so the open development program was designed to do exactly that. So really what we said was we're going to pull away the devices. We're still going to maintain the network as we always do. And we're going to allow you to bring in your hardware, your apps, and tell us how you want to hook in. We're going to do some quick certification, you know, something less than four weeks to get a new device online, and then enable you to sell that device on the network. Okay, again, so big change for us, and you don't get to that 500% threshold unless you do things like this. Verizon Developer Community. Okay, so that was actually announced back in July. We had our Verizon Developers Conference uh, out on the West Coast. And, you know, again, this wasn't that, hey, we're going to build, you know, the application store that's going to take over the world for a particular device. This was about creating an organization on the marketing side and on the engineering side that's dedicated to helping developers 
pick the areas where they want to try and excel. Is it a particular device? Is it a particular OS? Do you want to leverage new network APIs that we're going to be bringing into the marketplace? You know, so things like presence, things like QoS, are these things that are going to help enable you and help you to differentiate you know, so that you have an opportunity to actually get out to consumers, get to leverage some of the marketing capabilities that Verizon has so you can actually gain some revenue back on the applications that you think are meaningful to the consumers. So again, it's all about enablement, you know, trying to figure out how do we actually help people to do more things that hopefully are riding on the Verizon network. 4G VF, 4G Venture Forum, I mentioned that's a funding mechanism. So I've got the players up here that we're partnered with. Um, essentially what it gives you is access to a little over a billion dollars for the opportunity to actually invest in products and services that could potentially ride on Verizon Wireless's network. They don't have to, but they could. So really what it is is venture folks getting together with Verizon, talking about you know, what do we think the needs are within the carrier space, where do we think there are some limitations relative to functionality, and are there great ideas out there that probably have only one gap left, that gap being funding, and can we collectively work together to close that gap and try and get that product into the marketplace? And it could be an app, could be a device, could be infrastructure. It's really not limited. So the last one I'll talk about here, um, as far as innovation on ramps, or really kind of four of them, the way we look at it, is going to be the LTE Innovation Center. So this was announced back in February at Mobile World Congress. Uh, Dick Lynch, CTO for Verizon, talked about what our plan was for LTE, when we're going to deploy it, why it's meaningful, why we think it makes a difference, why we think we're being so aggressive. But then one of the other key components was dedicating a facility, dedicating a team, dedicating the right kind of resources to help people build new devices. Because there's a recognition that if you build the network and you tell them what it does and you don't help them out in any other way, you're probably going to be disappointed at the rate at which devices come online with LTE. So our goal is really to build an open access platform or forum where individuals can come in with their great ideas, and you know, that's done through the portal. Basically says, I'm this person, here's my idea, let's take a look at it and figure out whether or not we can collaborate. And if we all collectively agree it's a good idea, you come into the lab, no charge, you have access to the engineers, you have access to our equipment, so we've got two live LTE systems running up in Waltham and basically emulating exactly what you have in a commercial network. And then you have the opportunity to bring that out either in the retail space or through our open development space. And then the last component of that, which I think is critical for something like LTE, because you're talking about different kinds of devices, is creating you know, what we call an experience center, where you have folks coming in, politicians, analysts, uh, large companies that you know, Verizon serves, showing them exactly how the devices work on a live LTE network so that they can understand, beyond just the slideware, you know, why it's so important. Okay, so, and really the focus for us you know, within that center is, as I state there, unlocking new categories of devices. So we don't really do certification. Uh, you're not going to see 12 e-readers with LTE coming out of that facility. What you're going to see is dedicated teams sitting down trying to figure out, how do I get to the next device? And what do I think that next device is? Why is it important? Okay, so it's really about trying to partner up with new companies, new ideas, to try and open up new categories of devices with LTE. So let's talk a little bit about why we think LTE is so important. So what I have in the chart here is uh, the first question everybody asks whenever you talk about the next generation of technology, how fast? Right? I think that's a logical question. Now, when you take a look at the trade rags and things that are read about technologies, whether it be WiMAX or LTE, there's a fair amount of focus on peak theoretical speeds. Um, what I would tell you is ignore peak theoretical speeds uh, and focus more on what the average expected throughput is going to be, which is what we try to display up here. Generally speaking, relative to 3G technologies, you're going to see an order of magnitude increase with LTE. So 5 to 12 down, 2 to 5 up. Big, big difference in the capabilities as far as trying to enable new functionality, especially if you're talking about things like video, right? Fair amount of talk today about video. Obviously, LTE is a great network for untethering video. Low latency, 
right? So, I mean, if you're talking about video, you're talking about voice, you're really talking about anything that's going to be time sensitive, gaming, you know, those are areas where LTE is going to make a big, big difference. And I'd be exaggerating or lying to you if I said that that's not a focus for a company like Verizon Wireless. You know, we definitely think that gaming is going to be a big space, fully untethered, you know, with a technology like LTE. So low latency is going to be critical component of the next generation of technology. Security, uh, also critical as well. Medical, financial, government, public safety. You know, that's a constant question that comes up relative to wide area network technologies. How secure is it? Do I need to throw a VPN on there? What else do I need to do in order to try and make sure that my communication and the data I'm trying to receive is, in fact, safe? So the big benefit for LTE is that right out of the box, natively, you're going to have encryption ciphering offered on the network. So 128-bit encryption. All right, so that, that's a change as well. And then probably the most important part, at least for folks like myself and my team that are working on new products, scale is really kind of the big change for us because if you believe, like we do, that LTE is going to be the primary technology for anyone that's thinking about connecting a device, and you know that that technology is not just going to be one that's in the U.S. or a couple places around the globe, but really everywhere in the globe, you have the ability to actually change the way we think about how to connect devices and when to connect devices because it's going to become an afterthought for people that are building products, building appliances on whether or not to put connectivity in there. It's just going to be known that I'm going to throw Wi-Fi in there and I'm going to throw LTE in there. It's just going in. And that's our view. And you only get there if you pick the right standard. It's going to have the right scale. It's going to drive down the cost for silicon and everything else that's required in your you know, bill of materials for the product you're trying to get out the market. When is probably the next big question that's asked when people say, tell me about LTE. So how fast and then tell me when. If you take a look at the capabilities that a company like Verizon Wireless has, we're actually uniquely positioned in that we bought that 700 megahertz spectrum. It's actually one frequency that runs across the 48 contiguous plus Hawaii. So essentially, you just have one band you have to throw into a device, and as we build the network, you're connected all the time. So because we have that, we're going to be leveraging that to deploy the network as quickly as we possibly can. So by this year, you know, we're going to have 100 million pops or people that we're tapping into in major metro markets. But then quickly after that, it's really our goal to try and build it out as quickly as we can to everywhere where we have spectrum. You know, so what we're talking about today is that somewhere around 2013, uh, you can expect a little over 285 million pops or something relatively close to what people know on the Verizon network today for EVDO or 3G. Okay, so this represents one of the most aggressive rollouts that we've seen for next generation technology. And it's not that we're necessarily in a hurry to get the technology out there. It's more that the folks that are building products and applications and services are really rushing to get to a next generation technology. So it's our job to get in there and try and build it out as fast as we possibly can. <clears throat> Talked about the global aspect for LTE. The reason why that's critical is that when you think about the decisions that were made for LTE, it wasn't just Verizon Wireless going in and saying, you know what, I think LTE is probably a good idea. It was really an initial partnership with Vodafone and China Mobile to take a broad look at what are the right technologies for next generation. We know video's coming. We know gaming's coming. We know it's all about tons and tons of bandwidth. So how do you pick the right solution for us? What's the right standard? After we made that decision very quickly thereafter, there were a number of other carriers who were obviously doing the same analysis and came to the same conclusion that we had, which is LTE is the right technology for fourth generation connectivity. And then if you take a look at where things stand today, I know Chris had mentioned there are 30 carriers on board with LTE. I take a little more expansive view in that uh, 30 is the committed, but we actually have over 130 that have said, I'm not absolutely committing, but I know that's going to be the direction for us. So right out of the gate, before you really have any kind of meaningful commercial networks, there are really only um, two, well, one that's up and running in two different countries, uh, and that started in December of 2009. We already have a ton of carriers across a ton of countries up and running or plan to be up and running on LTE. So again, that's a meaningful component to trying to figure out how do we get to the next generation for devices and for applications and then in total the service? 
Wanted to give you just a quick overview. So um, my team and I just got back from CES. Uh, we had a meaningful demonstration of LTE, embedded LTE devices running over a live LTE network. So this was a uh, concerted effort between Verizon Wireless and the vendors you see on the screen here to pull together, in essentially a couple months, products that people hadn't seen before with LTE. And what I can tell you is that we were wildly successful from my standpoint because we had a live LTE network up and running, pre-commercial, and we had live devices up and running as well, also pre-commercial. But the important thing is that they weren't dongles, right? It wasn't about just getting connectivity to a laptop. There are really different kinds of devices trying to do different types of things. So first one I just want to touch on, security and home monitoring. So I think the view here is that you can certainly do home video, uh, home monitoring, home control through other technologies like Wi-Fi. You can certainly do some of it with 3G. There's no question about it. But I think if you really want to unlock it, the thing that we showcased here was you had the ability to build a single device with LTE in it that's going to have a national fabric of 4G wireless that you can tap into that essentially gives you the ability to open up a box, power it up, connect a couple Z-Wave devices around the house, and you've got full control over everything that's meaningful to you in your home. Okay, and I think the critical thing there is that it's, it's really all about simplicity. You know, I mean, I can go to Home Depot and buy a whole assortment of different products and kind of geek out for a weekend if my wife would let me and pull together all the home control. Everybody knows that we can do that. But I think the key here is that it's about the simplicity. It's about, you know, picking up a device like this one. I've never seen it before until today, but I know what to do with it immediately. You know, that's the kind of thing that we're trying to enable through LTE, that it's always connected. You don't know why and you don't necessarily care. And you know exactly what to do with the device immediately because it's obvious, it's intuitive. So that was one of the ones we showed. The second one I think was really powerful. Uh, so this was with Samsung. So we had LTE embedded digital camera, uh, LTE mid, and we had an LTE connected frame. Okay, so think of like a digital picture frame. Now, if you're thinking about, you know, di digital picture frame, who really cares? You know, the, what's the big deal there? We've all seen them. We all have them. The big difference that we had in the show was that while we were taking people through each one of the demos, we were taking live video, taking live pictures, pumping it up over the LTE network, and then in a matter of seconds, pumping it right back down to that frame. And the thing that we saw in that was the aha with everybody that says, you know what, the problem with these digital frames and these you know, so supposedly connected frames is that they're really not connected. They're really not getting the content onto the device when I want it. So the beauty here is that you have the flexibility to make a value judgment to say, hey, if I'm out and I'm watching my son's soccer game and I want to show my mom immediately what's happening, I have the ability to do that. I don't have to show my mom how to get on Facebook. I don't have to throw it onto Facebook. I just, I have a purpose-built, dedicated device that's immediately connected. I don't have to show her how to get it onto Wi-Fi or if she has a problem, fly down to Georgia and try and figure it out. But it's immediately connected, and I control the content going down to that device. Because I have a relationship with Verizon Wireless. I know what that device can do. I know how to get the content over there. So I really have the real-time content distribution that we all talk about, and folks in this room can do pretty easily, but the vast majority of the folks cannot. Mobile video conferencing. So we're talking about Skype, right? Video conferencing is going to be a big deal. I'll just give this presentation to myself. I got a little screen here if you guys want to crowd around. <clears throat> ah, we'll keep going. It's fine. You'll get the gist of it. So mobile video conferencing was the next one. So we worked with a company called, uh, you know, Creative and LG with Verizon Wireless pulling together purpose-built devices for video conferencing. So, I mean, that's big in public safety enterprise space where you have the ability to take a device really anywhere in the country and anywhere in the globe and get a real-time multi-person video conferencing session up and running to discuss whatever it is you need to try and tackle at that point in time. The last one we had, which was probably most impressive from an individual device standpoint, was Moto, NVIDIA. Uh, ICD was another company that partnered up to build basically a PVP, personal video player. And we are streaming 1080p video over LTE down to the device flawlessly. And to me, I feel like that's a big deal because you think about you know, the uh, high-def wars relative to storage. I think it was only decided roughly two years ago that we're going to definitely go Blu-ray. Right? So then now here we are two years later. I don't even really care about Blu-ray. I'm streaming it down directly to the device off the cloud, wherever it may be, whenever I want it. 
Okay, so those are the kinds of capabilities that we think are important for these next generation devices. And so those are just a couple of examples, but I think the important thing is even if you heard about some of those devices and you're like, eh, I'm not going to buy that. That's not the important message. The important message is that we can do those kinds of things with really any kind of device that's out there. Now, the next slide is really going to lose a lot of impact because you guys, oh, there we go. Okay, good. <clears throat> so let's get to the anything. I've got a picture of a washing machine and a refrigerator up there, which most of you will probably look at and say, that's ridiculous. Why would you ever put wide area network technology into those devices? I want to just walk through why that may make sense and why I think it does make sense and why I'll tell you that companies that we're talking to right now absolutely think it makes sense. If you take a look at you know, what you have without LTE, you know, you've got no connectivity, the kind of business you're in is really finished goods, I can put new features in it, I can do new things, and I can try and sell it as best I can. I can cut price, but I'm really kind of constrained on what I can do. Um, intelligence, customer connection, you know, those are fairly limited, right, because I don't have the connectivity into the device. I can try and reach people via email, warranty cards, things like that, but it's not terribly effective. Uh, maintenance is, you know, unanticipated, and I've got to get a truck out there, and I may have the part, I may not. I don't really know, because I don't know what's going on with that device, besides that the customer tells me I've got a P1 error flashing on the screen, right? And then upsell and applications, again, are going to be limited and also static. Right? So whatever I put on, on that device, because it's not connected, that's pretty much what that device is going to have into perpetuity. If I connect it, what do I have now? So I've got an always-on device. So that means that if I'm someone like a GE, I can know not only it was sold at a Walmart in Scotch Plains in New Jersey, but I know where the device was delivered. I can give it a lat long. I can know when it was powered up. I can tell you how that device is performing or anything else that you want to try and figure out within that machine or that appliance. That's meaningful. You know, there's real benefit to, to companies that are trying to look at how am I changing my business model. Finished goods, you know, so I'm selling a refrigerator for 1500 bucks. Maybe I'm not. Maybe I'm selling a refrigerator for 500 bucks or a washing machine for 400 hours, and then I'm charging based upon time, or I'm charging based upon wash. And you know, again, you could always connect these devices via Wi-Fi as well, we all get that, but I think the difference is, when you're trying to connect things through Wi-Fi, you've got a complexity issue if you're someone like a GE, because now you're introducing the customer into the type of business model that you have. I've gotta get it onto their Wi-Fi network, I need to hope that their Wi-Fi network's gonna stay up, I need to also hope that they're not gonna try and get around this new business model that I have. If you do it over the wide area network, you have a business relationship, if you're a GE, with a Verizon Wireless that really no one else can intrude upon. Right? So it's you and Verizon, or you and ATT, or you and Sprint, whomever it is, getting together saying that connectivity is important to the kind of machine that I'm building and the service I'm trying to offer. I'd like to make sure that really it's just you know, the carrier and the appliance provider that are maintaining that connection. If you take a look at market intelligence, customer connection, you know, those obviously change dramatically because now I know real time exactly what's going on with those devices and I have the ability to reach out. I gotta figure pretty much every machine is gonna have an LCD on there and I can pump out whatever kind of content I think is necessary or meaningful. Maintenance I think is gonna be critical as well. Right, so I, I'm gonna assume that the vast majority of these devices that have issues in the future are gonna be able to be resolved via firmware updates. Or, if I can't do it over the air via firmware update, I can probably recognize immediately what the part is and have a driver go out there and fix the problem in 10 minutes as opposed to 10 hours because they went out there, the part they thought they needed wasn't there, they've gotta go back, the customer's annoyed. You know, all those types of customer issues you wanna try and get around, if you possibly can, are now a possibility if you have a connected device. Upsell options. If you're like the vast majority of folks that get that little blinking light on your refrigerator that says, hey, your filter, it needs to be changed, uh, roughly 90% of the folks, if you talk to the people that build refrigerators, will tell you what they do is they hold the button down for three seconds, blinking light goes away, and then boom, I got a brand new you know, filter, right? Well, obviously you have the same old filter. And not only do you have perhaps problems with the quality of your water, but probably more importantly, if you're someone like a GE, you've lost an opportunity to try and sell into that customer again 
because you don't have that connection. If you've got a connected device that says, hey, Brian Higgins, I know you've got a problem with your filter here. It needs to be replaced. Would you like me to ship three of these out to your address? I know where you're located. I'll get it out to you the next day. All you have to do is hit yes, and I'll charge your card. That's an easy one. That changes the way we think about the types of things that we're doing. And that's why I say, you know, when we talk to people that are looking at this space, they absolutely get it. And that's why we're partnered up with them to try and figure out how do we make these things happen as quickly as we can. And then the last area, um, if you read the paper this morning, you probably saw that uh, the Kindle, they've got a new SDK out there for app developers to build applications on the Kindle. Right? That was great and that was timely because that's exactly the thinking we have at Verizon, is that application platforms are not just about smartphones. They're really going to be about anything that's out there where a manufacturer or even a carrier comes up with the realization that, you know what, I don't have all the best ideas for every single application that's out there. But you know what I do have? I've got a connection to customers. I can give you some tools to build something that's cool, and I can give you the possibility of actually reaching out to them and doing something different. So I think the view is that for all the devices that are out there that are going to be connected, they're going to have the same kind of SDK, same kind of platforms that open up new types of applications. Think about your vehicle, right? That's an easy one. If I'm someone buying a GM vehicle and I have applications that I really like in my GM vehicle and it's time for me to get a new car, if I have an application platform that people are throwing apps on, I'm going to think twice about going to a Toyota or a Nissan if I know I can't get those same applications on my next vehicle. You know, those things are meaningful and those things become possible when you get the right kind of connectivity in there and the right kind of support for developers. So hopefully, what you gathered out of today um, is that there's a firm belief, and it's not just Verizon's belief, it's really anyone that's in a carrier space, that there is going to be a dramatic and massive increase in the number of devices that are going to be connected. And it's not just about wide area network technology. You know, I know there was a stat up there talking about Wi-Fi. We buy into that. It's going to be more of a value judgment where people say, hey, do I want to try and connect with this device while I'm out in the open? And I know there's going to be some sort of a charge for that, but I value that enough to, to pay whatever that fee is. Or do I want to go a little more nomadic, wait till I get home, and then I'll hook up, and it's relatively free to me, or close to free to me, for that connection. These are all within the realms of possibility. We expect it. Uh, we know it's going to happen. But again, I think the important thing is that all the devices are going to be connected, and it's not just going to be about nomadic connection. It's going to be about connected everywhere. App and platforms, diversification. Now, I think that's the key here. So I think we've just seeing the tip of the iceberg, as everybody likes to say, relative to apps and app stores and what you can do. You know, if you're thinking about applications and you're thinking about apps for smartphones only, you're not thinking broadly enough. You need to think about all the other devices that are out there, like that connected frame, that may have an SDK that people could tap into to push out new kinds of applications. That's absolutely going to be happening. The last and probably the most important part is that you know, it's not going to be minutes of use uh, type game that the carriers are used to. Um, may not be standard monthly service fees that we know for various services that are out there. We're going to have to think on a device by device, service by service basis, what's the new business model? You know, so I think when we talk to folks about getting LTE embedded into it, everybody gets it right out of the gate. But then the next question is, what's the model? Are you making money? Are we making money? Is it your customer? Is it my customer? You know, what do we want to try and do here? And I'll tell you that we've had you know, a broad discussion on really every possibility that's out there. And I think all the possibilities uh, have their puts and takes. But you know, generally speaking, the fact that we're talking about it is very positive. Because it changes the way people are thinking about applications, devices, connectivity, and the future intelligence that all of us are going to have in all the machines that we're planning on connecting in the future. All right, that's my talk. Thanks, Thanks Brian. So uh, a couple comments just on the rest of the day. Uh, hopefully I'll see all of you at 12 o'clock in the session that sh which will discuss the Avaya Nortel Roadmap. I also wanted to welcome everyone to the Startup Camp Telephony at 5.30, and don't forget there's a Honda motorcycle giveaway sponsored by Positron. And at 6 o'clock, the keynote from Jamie Siminoff of Ditech 
Networks. Thanks. Have a great show, and I'll see you guys later on today.